Grab your Bibles. Um, let's pray, and then we. I want to finish up the sermon that we shared on this past week to allow God to move and have His way in our midst. So, just do a quick review, and then just share share a couple of things with you that God has on my heart, so we can hear and be who God would have us be. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to hear, Lord. Speak clearly, Lord, that you would just have your way in our midst, Lord, that we would be who you would have us to be. So I, I thank you for you. I worship and I adore you, Lord. I'm praying that Felix dies and that you would have permanence and reign in my life, Lord, as we share your word this morning. It's never about me, but it's all about you. So encourage someone today, Lord, not to quit, not to give up, not to put an end to it. So we bless you, we worship you, and we adore you, Lord. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. I'm going to say this a couple of times this morning as I go into the Word because um, this week in my time of prayer, the Lord just really impressed on me that um, to make sure people understand what is meant by the statement, God can raise you up. So turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, God can raise you up. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, God can raise you up. Amen. Let me, let me tell you just briefly how this word has impacted me and we can go through. You know, uh, sometimes when you're in ministry for a long time, when you're doing things for a long time, it's easy halfway through that on the midst of that to get tired and to want to give up and to lose the energy that you've had when you first, when God first spoke, spoke to you. I, I want to encourage us this morning to realize that if God has deposited something in you that you've given up on, that God can rekindle that fire. Come on, I, I want you all to hear me say that, all right? Because a lot of us, Miles Monroe said this many, many years ago, the graveyard is filled with so much unrealized potential. You don't want what's in you to go to the graveyard. Are you hearing me? So that's the thing that God has given you. And I just want to remind you today that God can raise you up, that God can do that in you. God can bless you, and God can move mightily in your midst. So let me just review briefly what we talked. We're in the book of John chapter 11, and I want you to go there real quick. Um, we're sharing about the story of Lazarus, and I want to encourage you to go online and um, listen to that. The first part of the series said, I just want to put the, the capstone on the end of it and share the back part of the story. But here's what we said last week, that God is glorified when we learn the truth that we are on his time, not ours. Timing is not about me. It's, not, it's all about God, right? And we have a way of saying he may not come when you want him to, but he's always on time. But yet for some reason, when God seems as if he's delayed and he hasn't showed up when we want him, we run into trouble with that. And that's when we lose faith and we lose hope. And we saw that it doesn't matter how close we are with God, looking at Martha and Mary's relationship with Jesus being from that town of Bethany, our relationship, our personal relationship has no impact on adjusting God's time because he's sovereign, he's in control of the world. We can't move him to come to our clock, but circumstance will cause us to adjust to God. Very, very important that we not miss that. And then also, the providence of God mandates that all of our experience work together for the good. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Here's what we said Wednesday. You got to go through. Yeah, come on. Come on, y'all. You got to go through something. And, and, and a lot of us don't like that because we want to be delivered from the thing, but it is in the going through of the thing that we get the glory from God. So, so don't miss that, you know, because it puts things in perspective. God delayed his showing up with Mary and Martha in that town of Bethany so he can get the glory out of it. And he allowed time for Lazarus to die before he even showed up. That tells me, Felix, you've got to go through some things. And me going through does not mean that God is not God. Are you hearing me this morning? That does not mean he's not God. And so we need to seize the moment while working with God when the timing is right. Man, you needed to hear what was shared on Wednesday on that. Just some heavy, heavy stuff. And so he intentionally delays his intervention um, to put us on his time. And here's the second thing we shared. He's also glorified when we recognize Jesus, let me say it this way, as a present tense God. Okay, Lord, if you had been here, we're going to see this in a little while, um, my brother would have died. And, and when he shows up, it was four days later. That means time elapsed, but God could still work. Time bears no factor. We also saw that location bears no factor on his ability. If you had been here, he doesn't have to be there to work. We're going to pick that up a little bit this morning. Come on, say amen. 
And then the more important statement that was made, here's what he says to Martha, right? I am the resurrection and the life. And I really like that, the ever-present tense of the verb to be. Here's how I want to summarize that. With God, there is no past or future. Process that for a little while. Everything is right now with God, right? If things could be past tense and future tense with him, it's implying that there's places that God cannot be. Y'all all right with that? So here's what he says to Martha. I am. I can go where Lazarus is and bring him back into my time. Everything is present tense with God. Come on, say everything is present tense with God. So here's the third and final thing I want to share with you, and I broke this down into three parts to hopefully make sense. Number three is this. God is glorified when we afford Jesus an opportunity to restore life to situations we have given up on. And I want to say it that way because I know we're talking about Lazarus being dead. I know we're talking about God raising Lazarus from the dead. But I want you, for the purpose of application today, to think on what dream may you have had, what circumstance, what situation, what predicament. I want to bring you good news today. With God, it's never too late. Oh, come on, somebody ought to say amen. Come on, with, with God, with God, it's never too late. God, God, I mean, he, he allowed Abraham to get to 99 years old. Come on. Yet he still used him miraculously. With God, it's never too late that God can raise you up. God can restore some things. But there's a process that we need to go through to realize who God is. So go to the back part of John chapter 11. Jump down to verse 28. Let me read those verses, then we're going to walk it through. And if you missed last week, I just want to encourage you to download the podcast. I believe it will be a tremendous blessing to you as you put that together with what God's going to share with us this week. Say amen if you are chapter 11 of the book of John, verse 28. Amen. Notice what it says from the ESV. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she quickly rose and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord... She's saying the same thing her sister Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews, it says, who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Then the shortest verse in the Bible, two words, it says, Jesus, what? Wept. Wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? Lord Jesus, that verse is so preeminent. Then Jesus deeply moved. Here's that phrase again. He came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order. Some of your translation says he stinketh by now. I like that one. For he has been dead for how long? Four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around. This word is for you today, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man, look at the past tense verbs, who had died came out. His hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. Uh, with cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. In other words, some of your translation says again, loose the man and let him go. Amen. Here, here is my problem. 
Here's my problem as we pick up the last part or the latter part of this text. Is when I look at this passage that's in front of me, I can't help but read verse 28 where Jesus shows up on the scene. He's at this place where he was. Martha, who we saw last week, had an encounter with Jesus saying to him exactly what his, her sister says. She runs out to meet Jesus where he is. Then she, calls, she comes home. She has her encounter with him. She leaves Jesus there. She goes back home. She grabs her sister Mary. Mary gets up. Mary goes to where Jesus is. And then notice Mary says now the exact same word that her sister said to Jesus. Look at verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. And Jesus does not respond to her. He goes on this thing where we see we're going to talk about that in a little while. Here's what I want to bring up about that. Here's my attitude. And here is, I, I, I think I'm comfortable saying some of our attitude when Jesus is delayed in responding to our request. Notice, uh, here's what I said last week. The intricate details that the author gives us about the relationship these girls had with Jesus. Their full expectation was when they call him, he should show up. Okay? And because the author even gives us detail in the beginning part of chapter 11, now Jesus loved Mary and Jesus loved Martha and Jesus loved Lazarus. It talks about an intimate relationship with these two. So here's what I'm saying that to get you to lock into this. It's no accident that the two sisters repeat the exact same phrase when they encounter Jesus. Now why are you saying that, preacher? Because I am led to believe, this is me in my own imagination, as I process this text, because those two girls were human, when day one passed and Jesus didn't show up, they had a meeting. Y'all can stay quiet all you want, okay? Because here's what happens to you when Jesus doesn't show up. You too have a meeting. Oh, come on, y'all. They, they had a meeting, Pastor Steve, and I'm led to believe that they had a conversation when they had a meeting. The nerve of him. You know how much that alabaster costs? Come on, y'all. You know how much we, we, we gave him a place to sleep and how much cooking we did. You know how expensive that catfish was? Come on. They, they had a meeting, right? They had a meeting. And I believe it escalated to the point where they came to the conclusion he should have showed up because they, shamed, they, they shared the same verbiage. The moment Jesus came, here's what we concluded. You should have been here. And because you wasn't here, now that you showed up, we don't care anymore. And, and that's my problem, right? And that's your problem, is that as time lapses on, when God doesn't show up to do what we want to do, we develop a lackadaisical accident, uh, uh, mindset, and we start to turn things off, and here's what we say, we don't care anymore. Oh, come on, talk to me. Don't act like I'm talking to myself. You've been through a situation. You've been through trauma. You've been through difficulties. You've been through hardship. You had a dream. You had all this stuff. And because God didn't show up in the moment when you wanted him to, as time lasts on, you got comfortable. I'm just going to go. I don't, I'm not going to join nothing. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to get connected because I don't care no more because ain't nobody. I wish I had somebody in here. That's not going to happen to me no more. I'm not going to give him a second chance to allow this to happen. Why? Because I don't care anymore. And we unplug and we get comfortable. And more times than often, I'm going to say this later on in the message, is because though we say we know him, at the depths of things, we only believe he can work in the moment. And outside the moment, he has no ability Right? Because, Lord, had you been here, you'd fix it. But it's broken now. And we really don't believe that he can still fix it. Because it's outside the moment. And lock into this. Here it is. There's no outside the moment with God. If you get that. Right? We just have to stay lockstep with him. Right? We have to stay lockstep with him. So very, very important that we not miss this. So here's a couple of things I want you all to see about the text. So here's to allow Jesus 
if we want to give him opportunities to restore life to our things that we've given up on, there's a couple of things you must do. Number one, we must understand that Jesus is grieved by our inability to trust him with the miraculous. Okay? He's grieved, he's grieved when we develop the attitude of I don't care anymore because we've said he can't do it because he's missed the moment. Okay? Look at the text. Look at the text. Let's walk through this, and I want to show you some things. Now, notice what it says here, verse 32. When Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, my translation says he was deeply moved. Your translation might have a different interpretation of that same Greek root. This moving was in his spirit. And notice the repetition, and he was greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. I'm going to read this. We'll come back to it. So he wept. I'm going to talk about that. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Look at verse 38. Then repetition again. Then Jesus deeply moved. My translation says, again. And he came to the tomb. Okay. Now, I think it's very, very important for you to not miss what the author is communicating to us about Jesus' attitude as it relates to what was happening at the time of the text. Because I think there's relevance and application there to communicate to you and to communicate to me what we do to Jesus when we develop the same mindset that these women did. Notice what I put here. He was deeply moved, he was greatly troubled, and it resulted in tears. Okay, so I want to take a moment to flesh that out so you can see and understand what all that is. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand when you do your work or if you do some etymological study on the Greek word that is translation deeply moved, I want you to see what that literally means. Here's what it means. To have an intense, strong feeling of concern, often with the implication of indignation, to feel strongly Literally, to be indignant. So watch the translation now. Then Jesus saw her weeping, and those who came with her was also weeping. His feeling was intense, or he was indignant. When I'm indignant, I'm not smiling, oh, praise the Lord, sister. I got an attitude. Come on, y'all. This is the second time he heard this from people who were close to him. The first time, he let it go. Y'all not hearing me. The second time, the author says he became indignant about what he just heard. Ah, Y'all not not getting me yet. Let me give you the next word, right? Watch the next word. He was greatly troubled. Look at how that word is translated if you do your etymology and do your work when you get home. It says, he was greatly troubled, meaning to cause acute emotional distress or turbulence. Here, here's, what, here, here's a correlation. You remember that the text talks about there's a time where once a year an angel would come down and it would trouble the water and there would be a stirring in the water that was happening. In other words, this troubling didn't result in the water being calm. There was a moving that was taking place. So here's what the text said. He became indignant and turbulence was in him. And here's what it also means. He, it resulted in him almost having a mental distress. He was distressed. What's up, Jesus? Why are you so indignant? Why are you troubled? Well, here's the conclusion. When you look at the text, these were people that should have known who he is. These were people that should have known his ability. Come on. These were people that it shouldn't matter how long it took for him to show up. He was still God when he showed up. Come on. These were people who walked with him. These were people who spoke with him. How dare they get to the place, listen to this, where they start 
They stopped trusting in his ability because time had lapsed on. So he had a major tood. Attitude. And I'm pointing that out because whenever we position ourselves the same way the Jews did and the same way Mary and Martha did and, and Jesus doesn't show up when we want him to show up and we develop the attitude that I don't care anymore. I, hear me say this. We tick Jesus off to the point where he looks at you and he looks at me and he gets to the point of indignation where he says, how dare you? That's not a good place to be, guys. Because, you see, when you read this text on the surface, you're probably thinking on the surface, oh, Jesus just loved them so much, and he was deeply moved because Lazarus died, and he was deeply sorrowful because Lazarus died. No, 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 no. Jesus was not concerned about Lazarus' death. Don't forget the text told us he allowed Lazarus to die. He did. He let him die because he knew he had the ability to do what? Raise him up. So don't make the mistake of thinking for one second he was crying over a dead. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on. They had seen him. Look at the text. Could not he who had raised the dead man, open blind eyes, able to raise this man? He knew his ability, so his ability didn't cause him to cry. The expression was over the people that should have known better. Known better. And when I give up on the calling of God, when I give up on the thing God has deposited in me because it hadn't happened in the time I think it ought to happen, I press Jesus to indignation and he looks at me and he says, how dare, I wish I had somebody in here, how dare you give up on me. And he does what he did. And here you hear you thinking, Oh, how he loved Lazarus. No, 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 no. He never stopped loving him. He's to death, hell, and grave in his hand. Come on, I wish somebody in here. Matter of fact, death can't happen unless he allows it to happen. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on. He has power over death. So not for one second don't get it twisted like the kids would say. That he was crying for Lazarus. Don't make that mistake. He was crying and let me explain crying, okay? When, when you look at that word crying, do you work when you get home? When it says Mary was weeping and Martha was weeping, here's what you need to know historically and culturally. culturally I'm almost there. Jewish custom dictated that when a person encountered a loss during the services, at a minimum, they were to, required to hire one flute prayer and one professional mourner. Do your work. Do your work, okay? Matthew 9 reads that way. It says that. So this is at the minimum you should do depending on your financial situation. So Mary and Martha were no poor people. You know that from Bethany, right? So imagine how many whalers they had. Imagine how many flute players they had. Imagine the procession to the graveyard, right? So here's what the author wants you to say. When it says they were wearing, ah, my baby, that, oh, 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 leaning over the coffin, crying on, making all this noise. Don't make the mistake for one second that that's what Jesus was doing. When it says Jesus wept, here he was silently. How dare they? And the pain of his indignation caused a tear to roll down his eye. Not a sound. And my concern, how often do we as living people cause Jesus to shed a tear? Why? Never again. A bank is never going to tell me no. I'm never going to get fired from another job. I'm never going to lose. An you kind of get where I'm going? I'm never going to be involved in ministry again. I'm never going to serve. And how often do we cause indignation in Jesus such that he's sitting there shedding a tear because of our inability to trust him? You kind of get it? There's a lot in this text, y'all. There's a lot in this text. 
Because that's what's really going on here when you look at what's happening in the text historically and culturally, right? So, so don't get to the place. Don't get to the place. Let me say it again. Don't get to the place. We need to understand that he is grieved over our inability to trust him with the miraculous such that we grieve, grieve him. Here's the second thing I want you to know. We must give Jesus then complete access to our burial places. Because some of us have dug some things real deep. Ain't nobody, no deacon, no preacher, no elder, no minister, I don't care who you is. <laughs> right? So let's read, let's read, let's read, let's read. I'm almost there. Let's walk through this. Let's walk through this. Let's walk through this. Then Jesus deeply moved again. Verse 30. He came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Then look at what Jesus said. Take away the stone. I love this. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for it has been, let me translate, a long time. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe that you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. So they, notice, notice the plural in verse 41. So they, plural pronoun, took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he started speaking to his God. I'm going to come back to that. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to roll the stone away. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Say, you got to roll the stone away. Very, 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 very important because here's what the stone symbolizes, is that there are places sometimes where you and I will become calloused over past hearts, and we become calloused over past wounds, and we become calloused over things that we've given up on never again. I'm never going to date me another man because what the last man did to me. I wish I had somebody in here. I'm not going to mess with another woman. Because of how those other women hurt me. And we become callous and we've rolled a stone in front of the thing. And here's the thing. It's been there so long that we're unable now to move it by ourselves. And then we don't want to move it because there's some stink stuff up in there. I wish I had somebody in here. We don't want to move it because it's been there so long that decomposition has stepped in and, and decay has taken place and you don't want to resurface those wounds. But listen to me, baby. If God is going to do some work in you, some things have got to come out. Some things have got to smell a little bit. I wish I had somebody in here. Some exposure has to take place so you don't find yourself there again. And I love the pronoun, I love the, the plural pronoun because here's what it says. You don't fool yourself into thinking you can do it by yourself. You might need to get some help to move this. But here's me. Ain't nobody getting in my business. I'm going to stink all by myself. <laughs> you better get some help. Come on, are you with me? Come on, say roll the stone away. Say it again, say roll the stone away. Because here's what happens when you roll a stone away. You give Jesus access to those places that we need the most healing from. Are you hearing me? Come on. Say, give him access. Now, let me show you a couple more things and I'll be done. A couple more things. Here's what. So you got to trust God, right? Come on, say, trust God. Say it again. Say, trust God to restore our dead situations. Let me show you this a couple more things and I'll stop. So now watch this. Watch this here. I love this text. It says, so Jesus said to them, verse 40. I'm in verse 40. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Look at verse 42. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing where? That they may believe that you did what? Point to yourself, self, God wants to heal me for the people standing around. I wonder, I, wonder, I wonder if you're hearing what you're saying. I wonder if you're hearing what you're saying. God wants to heal you, heal me, for the people that are standing around. Here's how he says it. The harvest is ripe and plentiful, right? But the laborers are what? 
Why? Because they've got stones rolled over the... <laughs> And the people that are standing around waiting for the harvesters, that's why he wants to do what he wants to do. So notice what he text says. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Say, that's verse 43. Come on, say 43. 43. Now, look at 44. The man, past tense, who had died, did what? Yeah, his hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. Then Jesus said to them, take him off, unbind him. I love King James. Loose the man and let him go. Verse 43, when he had cried these things, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then verse 44, he who had died came out. His hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus says, loose him. One more time, y'all didn't get it yet. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then, verse 44, the man who had died, yeah, past tense. Y'all saw that? He came out with his hands and feet bound street linen. I need to illustrate this because y'all ain't going to get it. Here's the tomb. Hey Amen. Get out my graveyard. Yeah. 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 Here's a tomb. Lazarus is in the tomb, bound. Lazarus, come out. And the moment Jesus said that, the verb says it's perfect tense, completed action with ongoing results. Here's what that means. He could be laying in the tomb as long as he want. He was already resurrected. He was already resurrected. By virtue of the fact that Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. He was already resurrected. Y'all didn't get that. It was up to Lazarus to be obedient to God's word, to take the initiative to get up and watch this. And get out the graveyard. You, you get that. You get that. You see what I'm saying? Because my problem and your problem is this. The stone is there. You hear me? So, and what I love about the text, they didn't even have to roll the stone away for Jesus to say, Lazarus, get up, right? And a lot of us, at the point of your salvation, I wish I had some theologians in here, he called your name and he said, get up, and he's given you the ability to be restored. He's given you the ability to walk it out. He's given you the ability to be free. He's given you the power. He says, oh, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. But look at you. Power all over you, but you're laying there motionless. Ah, I wish I had somebody in here. You've got to take the initiative to get up, bone and all, and get your way out of that graveyard. I wish I had somebody in here and allow the Spirit of God to lose you and set you free. I don't mean to offend nobody. Coming to church every Sunday. Hey, that's my gravestone. And just lay there. Won't get involved in ministry. Won't serve. Won't get involved because we love the graveyard. Because I don't tried that before. I don't care what Jesus said. And here's Jesus' indignation. He sheds a tear over living people that are still acting dead. Yeah. 
Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? When I say to you, no demon in hell can hold the people of God down. If I'm still in the grave, it's not because of what God said. It's my volitional choice. Are you with me? Because I like being in the graveyard. The word has already been released, perfect tense. You are healed. You have been set free. You are, I wish I had a church this morning. He has done what needs to be done. It's up to you and it's up to me to rise to the occasion and work with God where he is working. It doesn't matter where that work is. You've got a whole lot of folk waiting for the ministers that are sitting in the pew, waiting for the call people that are sitting in the pew, waiting for the business people, waiting for that thing that's wrapped on the inside, but because you died. And he didn't come when you needed him. Oh, he missed his opportunity. Here's what we say. So my season is over. Last I tech, Solomon says he's in control of seasons and times and places. And I stopped by long enough to say to you, if he can raise Jesus from the dead, guess what he can do to you? God can raise you up. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet. Let's give God a hand praise. He's that kind of God. He's the awesome God that we serve. He's a wonderful. Come on, come on, give him some praise this morning. That's the kind of God we serve. He's a powerful God. He's a raising up God. He's a God that has all power in his hand. How dare we stay in the graveyard? After he said, get up. Here's what I want to do. If you're here this morning, God has spoken to you. I'm sharing with our ministers, elders and deacons this morning, I've got a renewed fire. And, <laughs> and Pastor Derek, I'm going to say, you're responsible for pouring gasoline on me. You are, you are. Because you came to my graveyard and said my office and said, do what you're going to do. Did we hear from God or not? You kind of get what I'm saying? And my fire do, I think I'm going to burn you up. You come too close. <laughs> We've got to get like that for God. We must get like that for God. We serve a risen, a risen Savior. And the people of God ought not let the world dictate to us who we are and what we can and can't do. God has already released the word. Come forth, come forth, come forth. Come out, come out, come out, come out. And the fact is you've already been raised up. Quit living life there, right? Here's what I said Easter Sunday. Stop looking for life in the graveyard. Come out, come out, come out. If he raised Jesus up, he can raise you up. Quit sitting on those passions. Quit sitting on those callings. Quit sitting on the giftings. Quit sitting on the things that he's deposited within you. So here's the deal. If you're here and you haven't said yes to him, Man, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you're here and if I'm you and have not responded to God, I want to give you a chance just to come, just to allow God to be God in our midst. Because our ministers are here. If God is saying, you know, Father, I just need you again. Rekindle the flame, whatever it is. Come, come, whatever it is. Don't allow Jesus to keep weeping over people that he's already raised up. If he's speaking, come. Come this morning. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Pour out your spirit all over this place, God. All over this place, pour out your spirit. So that your will will be done so we can be about the Father's business. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we bless you. Oh, how we give you praise. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Thank you for who you are. Move in this place. Move in this place.